Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Jude, for that uh, nice introduction. Um, what I'd like to do is spend the next uh, 35 to 40 minutes or so talking about some new ideas that have been uh, percolating through our group and looking at electrochemically modulated approaches for treating the overall uh, CO2 emissions problems and the accumulation in the environment. And we do feel that electrochemical methods relying solely on renewable energies can provide a very good uh, uh, route to uh, overcoming some of these issues. Uh, what I'd like to do today is, is motivate the problem as well and talk about what uh, separation processes generally are doing. And then uh, talk a little bit about <clears throat> some of the processes that we are looking at with an emphasis on looking at the, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, looking at the um, uh, thermodynamics and uh, some new concepts that we are, are addressing. So obviously we all recognize that the temperature has been increasing rather dramatically and over the last few decades, it has been rather uh, climatic in terms of the increase in temperatures, particularly out on the, uh, on the West Coast, where the many records have just been broken in the last month alone. But of course, this is not a, a US centric uh, problem. Global warming is a, a, a major issue. And I'll say we have actually a global warning now because of what we are seeing at the moment in terms of the various impacts of the global warming around the, uh, around the planet. So uh, the question is, uh, what, what's causing this? Um, the IPCC report has recognized that this is a code red for humanity and that drastic action has to be taken immediately to begin to try and, and uh, minimize or ameliorate a lot of these uh, issues. So uh, as uh, Ju pointed out, uh, there's been a significant dramatic rise in carbon dioxide concentrations over the past uh, few decades. And these have been associated and very correlated very strongly with the temperature anomaly that we have seen, that the temperature rise around about a degree or so over the last uh, few decades has been associated with about a 30% increase in carbon dioxide accumulated in the environment. So clearly the carbon dioxide emissions are a huge problem. In addition, as he pointed out as well, acidification of the oceans is a big issue because the carbon dioxide reports to the ocean, about a third of the CO2 can end up in the oceans, reducing the pH, and of course also leading to uh, the destruction of uh, the habitat for marine life and the like. So what's the issue? Yeah. Well, clearly our, our whole society runs on, uh, on, on energy. Um, if you're looking at the transport, heat and power sectors, other sectors, all of which require significant energy resources uh, for them to be able to function appropriately. The, um, the, these resources are generally, of course, are, are generally fossil fuel resources, gas, oil, and coal, and they are not going to go away uh, completely for quite a while yet. And so we have to be concerned about what uh, their um, impact is on the global emissions. Currently, global emissions are on the order of about 35 to 40 gigatons per year of CO2. It's a significant uh, amount of CO2 we are pumping into the environment. Now, if you continue business as usual, uh, if, and, and we continue like this, uh, what we're going to see is by the turn of the century that the temperature increase is going to be on the order of four to six or maybe even higher degrees uh, Celsius, uh, which can be cataclysmic for the uh, human and, and uh, for the planet as a whole. So there's a really strong need then for us to be able to start reducing the CO2 emissions uh, to provide this. So if we want to keep the uh, temperature increase to be less than two degrees, we need to start taking dramatic um, action now to reduce this uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And in fact, by the turn of the century- yeah, Alan, sorry to stop. Uh, maybe yeah. you can try to turn on your camera now. I think it's fixed. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, it's, let's see if I can, there we are. Oh, there we yes, are. Okay. Super. We can okay. see you. Great. Everybody okay. can, can turn on now. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, so we, what, what we can look at here is the fact that uh, even, even by reducing the, the uh, emissions, we are still not going to be doing enough to keep the temperatures below two degree rise about the end of the century. And we actually have to start taking uh, um, CO2 out of the atmosphere as well. So we've got negative greenhouse gas emissions. Now this green region here um, is the mitigated. This is what we have to do in terms of mitigation of the uh, CO2 um, uh, emissions. 
Now, this can be achieved a number of different ways. Obviously, we're transitioning to non-carbon resources, nuclear, solar, wind, and so on. And that's a very good part of the whole uh, strategy. Unfortunately, that's not going to do everything. And we are going to have to have a very strong move to do, uh, look at carbon capture, utilization, and storage, in which we actually capture the CO2 as it's been emitted, so it cannot get into the environment. And once you capture the CO2, we need to think about uh, what we do with it. And this is really come to cooking at storage, uh, subsurface storage of the CO2 in uh, safe locations, or actually utilizing it for chemical, some fuels and materials and so on. But uh, this is not gonna be everything. There are a number of avoid unavoidable emissions, say from mobile emitters, such as aircraft, from agricultural activities and the like. And these are going to give uh, CO2 that cannot be mitigated in a traditional way. Now we have to then think about uh, being more aggressive in taking the uh, CO2 directly out of the environment. In other words, through uh, uh, direct air capture, through bioenergy with carbon capture sequestration, afforestation, all of these things, which can soak up the CO2 directly from the environment, rather than looking at the point sources. Now, how do we go about doing this? Obviously, capture is going to be an important part, uh, capturing the CO2. Um, there are a number of different sources of CO2, of course, and storage opportunities we've discussed as well. Now, the capture of CO2, there are a number of different processes. In fact, some of them are close to a century old now. They can be used effectively for CO2 capture, although they still are pretty uh, pricey, and uh, they do have uh, significant energy demands. In particular, we're talking about temperature swing type operations in which we'll, we'll discuss that briefly, and pressure swing. Um, the membranes are also coming uh, of, of interest. Uh, what we are gonna be talking about today, there are electrochemical means in which we can avoid the use of, uh, or the need for uh, uh, heavy uh, thermal sources for um, regeneration of the sorbents. And let's talk a little bit about that. The traditional modes for CO2 capture, we have adsorption in which uh, the acid gas stream is fed to a, a, a adsorption common, uh, column uh, in which we have the uh, circulating liquid absorbs the CO2 by either physical dissolution or by chemical uh, interactions. Once the, CO, once the sorbent is loaded with CO2, we then take it to a desorber where we, re we reverse that reaction, we heat it up, break the chemical bonds and drive off the gas itself. And then the solution is sent back to the sorber. Alternatively, we can have adsorption type processes where we have a bed, a solid, solid particles in the bed. And what we have in this particular case is that the solution, the solute or the gas uh, will adsorb onto the surfaces of the, uh, of the bed and uh, other through physio chemisorption type processes. Once the bed is saturated, we take it offline and then we regenerate the bed by heating it up or pressure swing, generally heating it up, driving off the acid gas, then cooling the bed down and sending it back again for the uh, uh, capture process. Now, there's a whole range of different sorbents that have been developed uh, for these processes. Some of them are fairly well established. Others are still very much in the uh, research and development phase. But you can see we've got a wide range of both liquid and solid adsorbents in these cases. And they can operate over a wide temperature range depending on the processes of, of interest. But this is not what we're going to be looking at. We are going to be interested in looking at electrochemically modulated capture systems, where we do not need to have other energy sources. All we need is a source of electricity, which hopefully will come from um, renewable resources. So we're going to regulate the capture and release of CO2 by changing the oxidation state of redox active species and uh, by changing the applied potential. And this is basically governed by the Nernst equation. In particular, let's look at a direct case here. If we have some, some compound, I've put Q here for quinone, but it could be any kind of a compound, it could be uh, other compounds as well. When we reduce it, we put it in an activated state. And in this activated state, it has a very high affinity for CO2, or CO2 has a high affinity for it in its activated state to form this particular complex. And this way we can actually then capture CO2 from the uh, surrounding gas stream. Uh, once we've uh, captured it, uh, what the like, we'd like to regenerate it and regenerate the capture agent, but also capture CO2 as a pure stream now. And so we'd end up then by doing an oxidation in this case, and so on. Now, the actual Nernst equation is shown here, but let's look at the, this gives the uh, concentration, the relative concentration of activated to uh, non activated uh, uh, moieties. And that can be determined very strongly by the actual applied potential. 
So when you go to the applied potential significantly different from the uh, redox uh, standard redox potential here, uh, we can then uh, change and modulate the activated species. So we can go from being purely activated to unact unactivated species rather readily by changing the potentials. We also have indirect approaches in which the actual capture agent, L in this case, is an independent. Uh, it does not affect, is not affected by any electrochemical activity. And uh, as we then capture the CO2 as, as we would traditionally. But then what we introduce is introduce another species that we can oxidize and it come to A plus. And when it's oxidized state, it has a much higher affinity for the, uh, the, the L has a much higher affinity for the uh, oxidized uh, compound than it does for CO2. So what happens is this A plus will displace the CO2, CO2 comes off at the pure stream. And then what you've got is this stream here, and we'll talk about this uh, shortly, uh, um, uh, how this can be applied uh, in a practical sense. There are a number of different electrochemically modulated processes for CO2 that have been uh, looked at. Uh, the things of interest to us are A and D here, and I'll talk about these uh, uh, in, in shortly. Um, we're talking about this particular case when quinones are reduced and they pick up CO2 uh, in this particular form as a, a, a carbonates, and then the carbonates can be uh, broken apart when you oxidize this, uh, uh, this complex and we can't really remove CO2. There are some other nice work, particularly done at Harvard and the like, in which rather than uh, capture the CO2, this uh, re reduction that leads to capture of the protons in solution. And this then raises the pH, which encourages the formation of the bicarbonate and the CO2 is captured here, the bicarbonate. And that can, CO2 can then be released by oxidation and uh, reduction of the pH. So the pH is de 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 decreased and CO2 is released. There's another one here, this EMAR process that's of interest to us, and I'll talk about that in some detail right now. So uh, let's just take a look at the typical absorption process. We mentioned that the uh, amine type systems can be used for capturing CO2, as shown in this case. We capture the amines, the CO2 are being captured by forming this carbamate uh, complex, as shown here. Um, and uh, generally, traditionally, what we would do is then take the solution and heat it up to break the chemical bond to drive off the CO2 and regenerate the amines. But in this particular case, we like to avoid doing that. And uh, we've the way we do this is by taking this solution and sending it to the anodic chamber of a, an electrochemical cell. The electrodes themselves here are copper electrodes. And so what we have is on the anode, we oxidize the copper and we get the cupric ion coming to solution, it complexes very strongly with the amines to form this kind of a complex, and the so doing kicks off the CO2. The CO2 can then be disengaged in the flash tank and sent off to a compressor, and then uh, the actual solution that we have now gets sent to a cathode chamber where we do a reverse process and we reduce the copper uh, to form uh, plates out on the cathode and we regenerate the amine, and then the uh, CO2 lean uh, the the copper lean solution goes back to the column. Now, typically, what we like about this, it's uh, the flue gas is pretty low temperature. Also, the operation here is isothermal too. Generally, we can release a high pressure if we need to, which reduces the compression cost later on. And typical energetics or uh, voltage is applied on the order of about half a volt per cell. And this is very modular. It can be a plug and play, and it also can um, be very uh, quickly responding to changes in conditions and rely simply on applying appropriate currents to the uh, system. Now, this just shows just an example of, of what we have built on the system. This is the uh, case, uh, this is the uh, desorber system here. It's an electrochemical cell, uh, and it's around about 20 by 10 centimeters in size. We've got the absorption column and things like that. We also have switching valves, because obviously what's going to happen is when you dissolve the anode and you're building up on the cathode, at some point you're going to run out of uh, capacity in your system. And so every now and again, we have to switch the polarity. So what was the cathode now becomes the anode and vice versa. We switch the flows to the two uh, cells and then we, we, we um, restart the system. So uh, this will show you uh, what we've done here. This will give you an idea of the kind of process we've got. This is the, um, the, the applied current, and this is switching from one, one set of polarities to another set of polarities. Now, the important part is that the CO2 that's been released 
is constantly released at about 100%. So we're getting pure CO2 being released. The actual gas output from the system, because what we, we release in CO2 from the amines, is uh, pretty substantial as well. And it's uh, pretty close to the theoretical output, which is what you'd expect if every single electron you pass through the system would uh, release a single CO2. Uh, cell potential also changes. This shows uh, what after about 100 hours of operation that we have very, very clean um, electrode systems and it's working very, very stably in these con conditions. We've run it for over 200 hours at some points. Now the thermodynamics are, are, are of interest here because they determine the overall energetics of the process. And so we've done a, a, a thermodynamic analysis of what's going on in these systems. These are the kind of equilibrium reaction that we'd have in, in the process uh, and the, uh, the constants and the like. And what we do is uh, apply very rigorous thermodynamic type solution modeling to understand a little bit of what's going on. And the important part here is this electrode potential is very strongly dependent on the activity of the cupric ions in solution. And this is gonna be determined uh, we're going to just look at the uh, equilibrium diagram or the thermodynamic diagram of the potential as a function of this activity of the cupric ion in solution and how it's impacted by all the other components as well. So let's take a quick look again at our, our, our thermodynamic cycle, uh, our, our, our process. What we have is a potential, the potential I was telling you about because of the Nernst equation, and this is the copper loading, the cupric ion loading and things like that. Uh, this is uh, the, the constant CO2 line, these blue lines are constant CO2 loading, which is the, um, uh, and all species, carbonate, bicarbonates, uh, carbonic acid and, type, and, and, and the like. The red lines are constant fugacity of the CO2, which if you're looking at pure CO2 in equilibrium with the solution, this would be the system pressure, for instance. And you can see this is going increase in the pressure there and a decrease in the concentration as we go in this direction. So we're going to go through the cycle and show you how um, it, it actually works. This is for this particular process. I want to emphasize that this kind of a, a thermodynamic cycle we have shown is, is valid for a large number of different kinds of operations and different kinds of uh, um, electrochemically based uh, separations in other papers that we've written. So uh, first we start out where we've got the CO2, uh, the uh, CO2 rich um, solution coming into the anode chamber at this particular point at the uh, fugacity of the uh, feed to the uh, flue gas absorption column. And then we begin to start uh, adding copper to the solution. So the copper loading goes up. We start adding copper to the solution until such point as we reach saturation. So at this point, until this point, no CO2 is being released to the atmosphere because uh, it's still in solution. Once we reach saturation at the system pressure, we begin to evolve the CO2 as gas particles, uh, as, as gas bubbles. And what we get then is uh, we follow this line along here where the CO2 concentration uh, it changes, it, it gets reduced, but the pressure it remains constant. And at this particular point, what we have is the um, the uh, uh, at the exit of the anode, and this is where we release the CO2. When we come into the cathode, what we do now is uh, come down here and the amount of CO2 in solution remains constant. The residual CO2 in solution remains constant, but we are changing the copper loading and therefore we are changing the uh, potential in this particular system until we reach uh, the uh, outside of the, uh, the outlet of the cathode and we go the CO2 lean um, back to the absorption column. So this particular thermodynamic cycle is like all other thermodynamic cycle indic indicative of the ideal energy required for the uh, separations. And indeed we can the minimum work required uh, is around that uh, can be looked at by integrating under this curve. And we get a minimum of about, about 15 uh, kilojoules mole uh, per, CO, uh, per mole of CO2. Um, I do we want to point out that it's not a 100% efficient process because in this first region here, which I just denoted by gray, this is a region in which no CO2 is actually being released to the, uh, the sweep stream. And uh, this is, uh, so this is, uh, these are electrons that you might consider are not being as effective in terms of uh, releasing CO2. So that introduces some kind of uh, um, inefficiency, you might say, into the process. But what we've got here is recognizing that the, what we really would like to know is what is the potential variation as a function of position uh, in the uh, anode chamber. So we're applying a, a potential across here. And so what we've changed, we can change this and plot the um, 
the concentration, the copper loading and the anode and cathode chambers as a function of position. So we actually now go one and three, a one and three there, and the function of position. We've got copper loading in the anode chamber as shown here, we're going from increasing the copper loading, whereas in the cathode chamber, we're decreasing the copper loading as we move up the column. So what we're looking at is the position in the column here. Now, what happens, of course, is we apply a voltage across the cell, and the voltage is not going to follow the thermodynamic uh, equilibrium type voltages. It's going to be constant across the whole, uh, across the whole um, cell itself. So this is really what we have then is this is the voltage that's actually applied in both cases. And here we'll have a pinch point under ideal type conditions. So now let's take a look at that again. Uh, the um, we recognize that uh, we, we cannot just uh, operate there. This pinch point means uh, it, it's a thermo it's a limit to, to, of operation, but we do need to apply some over potentials and shown by the blue lines here, these over potentials are what give us the driving force for the overall uh, process. And indeed, if you look at the energetics, the ideal energy associated with this particular system would be given by the dark gray, but the total energetics are given by the light gray uh, here as well. So this whole region here, and it's very easy then to calculate the total energetics associated with the process. Now, obviously we've got a lot of over potential in this particular case, for instance, here. And so what we can do actually is break this segments apart and reduce the energetic requirements by using a multi-segmented uh, cell as shown here. So we have different uh, smaller cells, each of which can have its own applied uh, voltage. And this shows a two voltage, uh, a two cell system. And we can see then that we've got a significant reduction in the overall uh, voltage in this particular case. So um, what this says is that we are able to engineer these systems rather effectively to give us um, uh, a, a decent uh, uh, energetics for the system. In this particular case, it's about 26 kilojoules per mole. When you look at it from looking at techno-economic and energetics analysis, we find that the EMR process itself is, is, is pretty, uh, it, it's, it's um, certainly uh, on a par or not better than uh, the uh, uh, traditional uh, thermal uh, type uh, processes. I want to emphasize, just take a look at this one here. We've got this particular here, the point here is a minimum that we can expect from an EMR process from a thermodynamic perspective. This is the compression energy required to compress the gas to uh, storage conditions. And then we also have these surface and transport over potentials. And this is where through clever engineering and chemistry and the like, that we can begin to reduce the energetics of the process. Because if we can reduce this, we can induce the, reduce the whole uh, energy required for the uh, separations. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a while. Uh, but just to say what the copper capture costs are, are pretty reasonable. If we, the membrane is what determines the capture cost quite significantly. But we're talking on the order of 40 to $45 uh, per ton, which is not an unreasonable um, uh, estimate. And this is from a very detailed uh, techno-economic analysis we did about a year or two ago. But I do want to just briefly mention that there are ways in which we can modulate the actual activity of these systems. Uh, if we can add a, a second amine to this, a mixed amine systems, we find a 50-50 um, mixture can lead to a significant reduction in the required cell voltage for the system, and therefore a significant reduction in the energetics. So we're going from about 40 kilojoules per mole down to about 35, 36 kilojoules per mole in this case. But we can also do this using surfactants in the system because we found out that uh, without the surfactants, the bubble formation disrupts the overall uh, electrochemical processes and we get partic copper particles forming in the anode chamber, which is rather surprising. But by adding surfactant to the system, we can uh, minimize those effects and in fact eliminate completely the effects we had before here. And this then leads to a reduction in the total cell potential needed because of much more efficient electrochemistry processes and uh, the reduction in the overall energetics to less than 30 kilojoules per mole. So it does indicate that there is a fair amount of engineering and uh, chemistry that can be brought into play here. But this is looking at the one case, the indirect case. Let's take a look at the direct type systems in which we're using a, a, a quinone type processes. In this particular case, we have a quinone molecule. This is benzoquinone. And when we reduce it, we get a very high uh, electron activity, electron uh, density on the, on the oxygens here, which make it very nucleophilic towards the capture of the electrophilic uh, CO2 to form these very stable uh, carbonates. 
And uh, so this is the way in which we can capture. Then we can release the CO2 by oxidizing this again, removing the electrons, getting back our stable um, dormant state for the uh, quinone and releasing the CO2 and then going through the cycle again. Now we have looked at how we might be able to utilize these in, in uh, a very effective way by um, uh, immobilizing the quinones on the electrode system. So this would be quinones immobilized on the electrodes and we need a counter electrode to the electron source and, and sink for the uh, reduction and oxidation of the quinones in this particular case. So if you look at this uh, case, and then we have a separator and everything is bathed in an ionic liquid electrolyte to provide the uh, ionic, conductivity, ionic conductivity that's needed. Uh, so basically, if we go through the reduction, uh, of the quinones, we, we, get, we go through the reduction as shown here, the CO2 gets captured as the, uh, in the carbonate form, and that's great. In the meantime, the ferrocene, the counter electrode is oxidized to give us the ferrocenium. Once this is fully loaded, we want to take it offline and then regenerate it and recover the CO2, and we can do that by reversing the potential and releasing the CO2 as shown in this case. In this case, we then reduce the ferrocenium back to the ferrocene molecule. So this is a very effective way to go. And in fact, we've looked at it uh, being rather effective in doing this. Uh, let me show you how we actually do this coupling and, and what's important in terms of the overall uh, process. So we've got these two cycles, the, uh, the quinone and the ferrocene type cycle. Uh, so let's see what happens when you change the voltages in the system. Now, according to the, um, uh, what you had here is, is the, uh, the um, the, the, the fraction of quinones that are activated relative to the uh, unactivated quinone and dependent on the voltage, according to the Nernst equation. And if you actually plot that as a function of potential, I've done this in a generic kind of way, the charge concentration, which will assume to be the same as the bound CO2. So we assume that every charge that's here actually captures a CO2 for, for now. So we get this kind of a process. So for significantly negative uh, potentials, we can get very high concentration of CO2 captured. We do need a, a counter electrode, and this is provided by the ferrocenium, ferrocene a couple, and we see that we have this kind of an approach now. So what happens when you apply a voltage? Apply voltage, it has to sort of come down and we want charge balancing. So we can, uh, this is what happens when you have a certain voltage uh, applied that we'll then have this level of uh, CO2 capture in this particular case. You have to have a constant, the charge balances on the two uh, electrodes here. Of course, uh, when you want to release the CO2, we can actually reduce the voltage and we come down to this point and the amount of CO2 that's released is given by the difference between the yellow and the green in this particular case. So how did this work? Well, first let's say, how do we make these electrodes? We normally take these polymeric forms of these compounds, wrap them around the uh, um, carbon nanotubes in a particular solvent, form the inks and use those inks for other drop casting or dip coating or, or other kind of uh, approaches, typical um, uh, uh, electro preparations. This shows the uh, very close up a 400 nanometer scale bar of the actual electrode structure themselves. And we see you've got a very porous structure. These are the carbon nanotubes that are coated with the polymers. Um, a similar kind of approach can be used for the uh, quinone type electrodes. And the reason this is important is because these carbon nanotubes ensure a very strong electronic conductivity that we need. The high porosity itself, which is uh, there's a lot of uh, ionic liquid in there, facilitates the ionic conductivity. And then the large surface area in here facilitates um, the adsorption and get high capacity adsorption of the uh, compounds. So how did this actually work? This is a, a, a demonstration showing the, the electrodes, the various components of the electrodes, these are sandwiched together and then uh, steeped in uh, ionic liquid electrolyte. And they put into a sealed cell. The sealed cell is uh, electrical contacts and is connected to a pressure transducer. Now, what we do is when we apply the, uh, the potential, we've got CO2 put in, in the cell. When we apply the potential, what of course will happen is that the CO2 will be absorbed, the pressure will go down, and then we can calculate the number of moles absorbed from the actual change in the pressure in the system. And this just shows you how effectively this works. Uh, this is the charge regulation. So this is when you're reducing the system, the reduction here, when you reduce, of course, we're then going to capture the CO2, as you can see there. And then when you go through the oxidation cycle, we uh, release the CO2 uh, down here. 
So you can see it's a very stable kind of a cycle. And in fact, um, it's about greater than 90% uh, Faradaic efficiency that's showing that very strong electron utilization in these systems. And the energetics about 40 to 50 kilojoules per mole. Uh, if you look at the capture and release, uh, this is another process, more of a flow type process in which we're capturing and we can minimum, uh, optimize, we can actually measure how much CO2 has been absorbed and then released. And this shows the capacity as a function of a number of cycles in the system. And you see the capacity remains fairly constant at around about seven uh, millimoles per gram of compound. And the columbic efficiency in these cases is really high, around about 100%, 95 to 100% in this case. So it shows that these kind of operations can be very, very effective. But the important part here is that we are able to capture CO2 efficiently by applying a potential, by reversing the potential, we can then release the CO2. And we can do this with a high degree of uh, thermodynamic efficiency. Of course, from a process point of view, what you're going to be looking at is capture and release of CO2 in adsorption beds, in which we had had the electrodes stacked as shown here. We feed a CO2 rich feed stream uh, to, the, uh, to the column, CO2 gets absorbed until such time as the bed gets saturated and the, the adsorption front moves through the bed. At some point, the total bed is saturated and uh, you begin to see CO2 uh, breaking through. Let's take a look at this one here. This shows the outlet concentration as a function of number of bed volumes or a function of time really, relative to the inlet concentration. And we see immediately that what we get is complete removal of CO2 for about 10 bed volumes in this particular case. And only when the bed begins to get saturated do we start seeing CO2 coming out of the column. So this is the kind of behavior that we want to look at in terms of overall uh, uh, um, operation of these systems. We can get very high capture and release of the CO2. Um, so let's take a look at what the energetics are, because that's an important consideration. Now, the energy is given by the amount of charge transferred times the uh, change that the delta V the voltage difference between the capture and the release. So this is the, it gives us the energetics under ideal conditions. We have to recognize that not every electron is efficient in terms of removing, of, of releasing CO2, the capturing CO2. So we have to incorporate a Faradaic efficiency in the system. In this particular case, we use a traditional one of around about 90% Faradaic efficiency. So if we come back to our graph as shown here, we've got the two uh, for the quinone and for the ferrocene. We recognized in the capture conditions, we had this level of uh, binding of CO2. The under release conditions, we had this level of binding of CO2. So the actual CO2 released or captured and released is given by this amount here. We're not use, utilizing the, the, the um, quinones fully, but we are utilizing it to a large extent. Of course, if we have a smaller um, difference between the capture and release voltages, we would end up being charge balanced at this level and the amount of CO2 released would be less, but the actual voltage differences would be less as well. So there's a combination of the energetics and the amount of CO2 released. Indeed, if you plot the fraction release, so this is using about 60%, 80% of, uh, of the quinones um, and the function release cell voltage, Actually, what you really want to look at is the delta V between the capture and release voltages. We can see that we, by changing the release, the fraction release, or the delta V, um, the lower delta V gives less release, but the important part is that the energetics are also significantly reduced. In this case, it would be about 35 kilojoules per mole of CO2, which is a very, very attractive uh, point to be at. So this indicates that these kind of systems can uh, work very efficiently from an energetic perspective. Um, we can also talk about continuous type flow processes uh, in which instead of having the uh, electrodes immobilized, the components Im immobilized, we can also put them in a solution. And so we have a, a case in which we have electrochemical cell where we have reduction of the quinone on one side and the ferrocene would be oxidized on the other. Instead of being immobilized, though, these are flowing streams. And when we oxidize, when we reduce the CO2, we can take it through an absorber and capture the CO2. We can then go to the second stage where we can uh, go to a second cell where we do the oxidation and reduction processes, reverse the operation, release the CO2, which can then be captured in the sweep stream, and we get the ferrocene uh, flowing through like this. It looks a lot like flow battery kind of operations, actually. This shows that this idea does work. What we've got here is the um, 
I just want to show it at different currents applied across the cell. Let's just look at the desorption rate. We can see the desorption is very strongly dependent rate. So this is the flow, the, the flow of CO2 being released. And we can see it's very strongly dependent on the applied current as one would expect. And indeed, if you look here, the even different, uh, more extreme kind of currents being used in this case here. The energetics are not quite as favorable as we'd like at this point, but these are very, very preliminary results and indicate that the concept actually, it works quite well. So let me just finish up by talking about a little bit about negative emissions. Um, what we're looking at here, of course, is uh, the fact that we can't just think about capturing uh, uh, um, CO2 at the high concentrations at the emissions. We have to think about how we can capture it in, um, in a, um, from the environment, a very low concentration, 0.04% as opposed to 4 to 20% CO2. And so the Climeworks has uh, the, uh, the process here, the thermal process working very, very well. Uh, it's a very interesting operation. Um, but we want to look at, can we do the same thing and rather than using the thermal swing type operations, can we use uh, our process electrochemical type operations? Uh, this is a small cell that we have built a multi-channel cell. Uh, and what we've got there is feeding CO2 at 400 ppm, very low concentrations. And we go through absorption and then desorption in the same stream just to do a cycle like this. And that when it settles down to steady state, what you find is the captured and released amounts are shown here and shows we are able to capture this CO2 rather effectively and then release it just as effectively and with a high columbic efficiency in this particular case. So it does indicate that these kind of electrochemical methods are very, very effective or can be very effective for looking at um, direct air capture type applications as well as for large scale type uh, point of source applications. We also need to be concerned about the uh, negative emissions in terms of direct ocean removal, that uh, uh, the CO2, the pH uh, nowadays around about 8.1, 8.2, 8.3 in this range. Most of the CO2 is in the form of the bicarbonate. If we can reduce the pH to a reasonable value, what we can do then is release the CO2 because more and more of it comes off as a soluble CO2 that can then be released to a sweet stream. So that's what we want to do is uh, modulate the pH, try to go from the bicarbonate to the CO2 and release the CO2 and therefore um, de uh, decarbonize the ocean, you might say. And this is one thing that we are looking at. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Sony, uh, Jack and uh, Kripa, who have been working with us on looking at some new concepts, uh, looking at how we can actually capture CO2 from um, Cells. There's been a lot of work done looking at electrodialysis type approaches. We've taken a different option approach here in which we use electrodes that can intercalate protons uh, or deintercalate protons depending on the applied uh, pH. So if we feed ocean water here, we apply the, um, uh, apply the electrochemical potential, we release the, the protons, <coughs> raise the pH and CO2 can then be disengaged. And then we can come back again and uh, re-alkalize re, uh, the, uh, the water by absorbing the protons and the like. And indeed, this has worked very effectively. This shows the voltage applied for the, uh, the first step, the, the decrease step, and then the regeneration step for the electrodes. And the removal rates we're able to get on the order of about 80% CO2 from the ocean uh, water, simulated ocean water in this case. The energetics are still a little higher than we would like, but we know how we can begin to improve on these and we're working on that right now. Anyway, I just wanted to point these out to you because I think this is an important uh, new direction that needs to be looked at very effectively. So how do we actually get the energetics for these systems? Well, um, we, we can think of the uh, direct air capture type systems, really large, large units distributed over many, many hundreds of meters. Uh, and we can capture the CO2 in this distributed fashion. And we can either release then directly from these units, or if we have a flowing system like we talked about, we can actually then capture the CO2 in the solvent and have a more centralized release type operation. No matter what we do, of course, um, we have to be concerned about what the power source is. And uh, this, if we want to use renewable resources, and we've got to recognize that the fair amount of land requirements for these, uh, if you think about um, wind power, 
you're talking about solar power. You're talking about generally, if you want to capture 500 kilotons per year, we need about 15 to 60 megawatts. So we're talking about very large solar farms, solar arrays and things like that, uh, which is not unreasonable. We, we can certainly do that, particularly if you start thinking about placing these in, in, um, in, in uh, desert areas and so on. Of course, what you might want to do is use something like the nuclear batteries that have much smaller footprint and can are not intermittent in the operation. And there's some very nice work going on here at MIT and elsewhere. And I think Jacopo Buongiorno will be talking about some of his work later on, I, I think, I believe. And so we can think of it very nice um, uh, operation. So um, the, the electric swing technology development. There's a lot of technology development that can still go on. You're looking at the fabrication and manufacturing of the electrodes. A lot of fundamental advances in the materials chemistry can be made. And we need to think about engineering the practical system and coupling with renewable resources, looking at energy recovery and integration and the like. But in conclusion, I think that uh, it's, it's really uh, evident that um, the electrochemically modulated CO2 type technologies could play a significant role in terms of uh, modulating, in terms of attacking the climate problem that we are looking at. We do need to control the CO2 accumulation in the environment. And we feel that these kind of approaches that we're talking about could play a big role in doing this. They not only are, are very attractive in terms of a number of operations such as being isothermal, plug and play, et cetera, et cetera, but they're also applicable across multiple scales and concentrations, both uh, point of source type applications and also for direct air and ocean removal. Uh, just to point out that the, uh, this is a fairly new area of interest. This shows you the list of publications uh, over the last uh, decade or so that you might have. And it, it shows that the, in the last two or three years, there's been a dramatic interest, an increase in interest in the um, electrochemically modulated type operations. Uh, it's only very recently have people really begun to take a strong interest in this area. And I think it's only going to grow as we uh, continue. So with that, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to acknowledge uh, if everybody that's been involved in this. And I do want to apologize for Kyle. I, I did not put you on here for some reason. Uh, I do, you, you are not, uh, your, your work is greatly appreciated and you should have been on this uh, list as well and my funding sources. So uh, thank you everybody for your attention. I'd be happy to see if I can answer any of the questions you may have. Thank you for this uh, fantastic uh, presentation. We have actually quite a bit of time for a uh, discussion. I'd like to start off by asking uh, Alan that we don't have a lot of time uh, and we know there's a lot of CO2 still being emitted. So uh, I like to see things, you know, you've talked about efficiency, the Coulombic efficiency and so forth. So to put things in sort of relative proportion, uh, let's say if we use your technology to completely flatten the CO2 emission curve, how much percentage of electricity we will need uh, relative to the current world electricity production and how much copper you would need uh, relative to the current copper production. And then you talk about amine and carbon nanotubes. So, so in terms of world production, do we have enough copper? Do we have enough manufacturing capability? Well, I, I, that's a really important question. And obviously I think it, be, it would drain, drain quite a bit of our copper resources and, and the like. I haven't actually done that analysis, I need to. Um, the electrical requirements are also rather significant. I think we worked out that if you wanna do direct air capture, uh, for instance, using uh, solar power, um, using our technology that uh, we would need, uh, that's what say removing 35 to 40 gigatons a year. From, from, the, from the environment, we would need a, an area of about 12 times the size of Rhode Island for a solar array to do that. So that is rather significant. Of course, if you're looking at places like uh, in the deserts, that, that may be a feasible option. But, but again, the, 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 uh, the resources needed would be quite significant. Of course, if we now go and use something more that, that uh, the nuclear in, nuclear type uh, reactor systems, their footprint would be significantly less. You also don't, you're not going to be, um, hampered by the uh, um, intermittency of solar or wind or anything like that. And you can have much more uh, uh, con continuous supply of energy in these systems. Great. Uh, 
We have a, a question from Mark and Jean, which is a technical type. So how did the surfactant help suppress the foaming in the EMR process exactly? Well, um, let's, that's a very good question. Um, I'm not sure we have the full answer to that, but um, the, the, uh, what happens is when we start releasing the CO2, it starts coming off as bubbles. These are large bubbles and they can disrupt the flow patterns in the system. They can also disrupt the actual electrochemical processes that are occurring. And we think what is happening there is that the electrochemistry is not quite as efficient as you'd like in the presence of these bubbles. And what you're doing is getting copper one coming off rather than copper two. And then uh, basically in disproportionation. So copper one would then go to copper zero and copper two. Copper zero would come off as particles. So we had that, that's why we saw some significant uh, particle formation. When we added the surfactant, what that does, it actually minimizes the size of the bubbles that are formed and actually keeps them to fairly small sizes. This will then not disrupt the flow patterns, will not disrupt the electrochemistry. And uh, we think that's what the, what the issue is. Interesting, we did not see foaming. You know, foaming was not an issue at, the, at those surfactant levels. So. Fantastic. Yeah, so uh, for the panelists, if you have questions, uh, you can just unmute yourself. Then for the audience, uh, please type in your questions. So there is a question from Haley Liu. Uh, so the flue gas uh, has uh, socks and knocks, and I guess also particulates. So in a, in a real industrial setup, uh, what do you do with those? Uh, because uh, you know, is, is the process that you've described uh, robust versus those? I th that's a very good question. I, I, I think in terms of particulates, obviously we would need to be concerned about the particulate removal ahead of time, depending on the extent that they are. Things like SOX and NOX, uh, these processes in particular look at the quinone type operation, um, they, they do pick up SOX and they bind SOX much more strongly than they bind uh, CO2 actually. But the SOX is gonna be a low concentration. So you can tolerate it for a while and you start building up the SOX quinone uh, complex until such point, it's like poisoning really, like catalyst poisoning and so on. So you can actually then think about uh, building up the stocks until it becomes a little too, too much of a degradation in the overall performance or capacity. You can then take the stream offline and up the potential quite a bit to release these, the stocks as well, and then um, and come back again. So that, that, that's not an issue. Uh, I should point out that we actually have a quinone type systems that, that can target socks quite strongly, but uh, do not uh, target CO2. The CO2 quinone binding is rather low. So we can actually go for socks completely. If we wanted to, we could go through a, a two-stage process, one removing socks and then removing CO2. Wonderful. Uh, so there's a question from Robert Hayes on jet fuel and uh, you know using uh, nuclear electricity. So I, th I guess the, really the question is, uh, you're showing carbon capture and then release maybe into a high pressure pressure condition, but is there a way we can directly with the electrochemical method to go to fuse? Uh, ah, so I think that that's a really important new area, uh, important area for the future investigation. I think we do need to be able to um, uh, combine uh, the, the, the capture and the uh, conversion processes in a single unit. Because basically when you got the CO2 captured, it's in somewhat of an activated state in many respects. And can we sort of exploit this for the subsequent reactions? There's been some fledgling work done in this area. I certainly know that uh, Ted Sargent and I know that Beda Gallant and, and our in mechanical engineering have done some work in looking at the EMR type process in which they, when doing the regeneration, they're able to uh, com couple that with, uh, um, with uh, utilization. In yeah. one case, make, making uh, chemicals, the other case, making uh, mineralizing lithium. Great. So we know in the, in the battery field now, people are moving towards a cycle life on the order of 10,000. So there's a question of, is degradation of amine another system component? So what's the, the sort of the record for the cycle life in, in your... Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I can't really comment on, on what, what the, our cycle life would be. We have done a little bit of work and see how obviously there will be some amine degradation. Um, there are a couple of issues I think that we are a little bit better off than, than in general is that we are working at lower temperatures. So we do not have as high uh, amine degradation that you'd have in the traditional thermal processes. And we also do not have the evaporative losses either as significant because uh, operating in these low, low temperature conditions. But that's a very important consideration.
and needs to be taken. And, and it was taken to account to some extent in our techno-economic analysis. Great. Maybe one last question. So uh, you work on the sort of voltage axis with the electrochemical process, whereas traditionally people work on the temperature axis. So yeah. the question is, can you combine waste heat and voltage you know, collectively and to have more efficient process? Very much so. It's actually, we've done, we've done that analysis for that EMAR process. I mean, look, if we do have some low grade uh, waste heat that we can then increase the temperature up to 70 or 80 degrees, maybe we can enhance the overall operation, over, overall operational efficiency of our systems. Very good question. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, thanks, Alan, for this uh, super exciting first talk plenary. So for anyone Thank who you. have more questions, feel free to uh, put in the chat or continue to ask questions.